The four main crusader armies left Europe around the appointed time in August 1096. They took different routes to Constantinople, some through Eastern Europe and the Balkans, some crossing the Adriatic Sea. Coloman of Hungary allowed Godfrey and his troops to cross Hungary only after his brother, Baldwin was offered as a hostage to guarantee his troops good conduct. They gathered outside the Roman era walls of Constantinople between November 1096 and April 1097. Hugh of Vermandois arrived first, followed by Godfrey, Raymond, and Bohemond. Recruitment for such a large enterprise was continent wide. Estimates as to the size of the Crusader armies have been given as 70,000 to 80,000 on the number who left Western Europe in the year after Clermont. And more joined in the three year duration. Estimates for the number of knights range from 7,000 to 10,000, 35,000 to 50,000 foot soldiers, and including non combatants, a total of 60,000 to 100,000. But Urban's speech had been well planned. He had discussed the crusade with Adhemer of Lepuy and Raymond IV, Count of Toulouse, and instantly the expedition had the support of two of southern France's most important leaders. Adhemer himself was present at the council and was the first to take the cross. During the rest of 1095 and into 1096, Urban spread the message throughout France, and urged his bishops and legates to preach in their own dioceses elsewhere in France, Germany, and Italy as well. However, it is clear that the response to the speech was much greater than even the Pope, let alone Alexios, expected. On his tour of France, Urban tried to forbid certain people, including women, monks, and the sick, from joining the crusade but found this nearly impossible. In the end, most who took up the call were not knights, but peasants who were not wealthy and had little in the way of fighting skills, in an outpouring of a new emotional and personal piety that was not easily harnessed by the ecclesiastical and lay aristocracy. Typically, preaching would conclude with every volunteer taking a vow to complete a pilgrimage to the Church of the Holy Sepulchre, they were also given a cross, usually sewn onto their clothes. It is difficult to assess the motives of the thousands of participants for whom there is no historical record or even those of important knights, whose stories were usually retold by monks or clerics. It is quite likely that personal piety was a major factor for many crusaders. Even with this popular enthusiasm, Urban was ensured that there would be an army of knights, drawn from the French aristocracy. Aside from Adhemer and Raymond, other leaders he recruited throughout 1096 included Bohemond of Taranto, a southern Italian ally of the reformed popes, Bohemond's nephew Tancred, Godfrey of Bouillon, who had previously been an anti-reform ally of the Holy Roman Emperor, his brother Baldwin of Boulogne, Hugh I, Count of Vermandois, brother of the excommunicated Philip I of France. Robert Kurt Hose, brother of William II of England, and his relative Stephen II, Count of Blois, and Robert II, Count of Flanders. The Crusaders represented northern and southern France, Flanders, Germany, and southern Italy, and so were divided into four separate armies that were not always cooperative, though they were held together by their common ultimate goal. The crusade was led by some of the most powerful nobles of France, many of whom left everything behind, and it was often the case that entire families went on crusade at their own great expense. For example, Robert of Normandy loaned the Duchy of Normandy to his brother William II of England, and Godfrey sold or mortgaged his property to the church. Tancred was worried about the sinful nature of knightly warfare, and was excited to find a holy outlet for violence. Tancred and Bohemond, as well as Godfrey, Baldwin, and their older brother Eustace III, Count of Boulogne, are examples of families who crusade together. Much of the enthusiasm for the crusade was based on family relations. As most of the French crusaders were distant relatives. Nevertheless, in at least some cases, personal advancement played a role in the crusaders' motives. For instance, Bohemond was motivated by the desire to carve himself out a territory in the east and had previously campaigned against the Byzantines to try to achieve this. The crusade gave him a further opportunity, which he took after the siege of Antioch, taking possession of the city and establishing the principality of Antioch. The armies traveled to Constantinople by various routes, with Godfrey taking the land route through the Balkans. 
Raymond of Toulouse led the Provençals down the coast of Illyria, and then due east to Constantinople. Bohemund and Tancred led their Normans by sea to Durazzo, and thence by land to Constantinople. The armies arrived in Constantinople with little food and expected provisions and help from Alexios. Alexios was understandably suspicious after his experiences with the People's Crusade, and also because the knights included his old Norman enemy, Bohemond, who had invaded Byzantine territory on numerous occasions with his father and may have even attempted to organize an attack on Constantinople while encamped outside the city. This time, Alexios was more prepared for the Crusaders and there were fewer incidents of violence along the way. The Crusaders may have expected Alexios to become their leader, but he had no interest in joining them, and was mainly concerned with transporting them into Asia Minor as quickly as possible. In return for food and supplies, Alexios requested the leaders to swear fealty to him and promise to return to the Byzantine Empire any land recovered from the Turks. Godfrey was the first to take the oath, and almost all the other leaders followed him, although they did so only after warfare had almost broken out in the city between the citizens and the crusaders, who were eager to pillage for supplies. Raymond alone avoided swearing the oath, instead pledging that he would simply cause no harm to the empire. Before ensuring that the various armies were shuttled across the Bosporus, Alexios advised the leaders on how best to deal with the Seljuk armies that they would soon encounter. The Crusader armies crossed over into Asia Minor during the first half of 1097, where they were joined by Peter the Hermit and the remainder of his relatively small army. In addition, Alexios also sent two of his own generals, Manuel Batumites and Tatikios, to assist the Crusaders. The first objective of their campaign was Nicaea, a city once under Byzantine rule, but which had become the capital of the Seljuk Sultanate of Rum under Kilij Arslan. Arslan was away campaigning against the Danishmens in central Anatolia at the time, and had left behind his treasury and his family, underestimating the strength of these new crusaders. Upon the crusaders' arrival on May 14, 1097, the city was subjected to siege. And when Arslan had word of it he rushed back to Nicaea and attacked the crusader army on May 16. He was driven back by the unexpectedly large crusader force, with heavy losses being suffered on both sides in the ensuing battle. The siege continued, but the crusaders had little success as they found they could not blockade Lake Iznik, which the city was situated on, and from which it could be provisioned. To break the city, Alexios had the crusaders' ships rolled over land on logs, and at the sight of them the Turkish garrison finally surrendered on June 18. There was some discontent amongst the Franks who were forbidden from looting the city. This was ameliorated by Alexius financially rewarding the Crusaders. Later chronicles exaggerate tension between the Greeks and Franks but Stephen of Blois, in a letter to his wife Adela of Blois confirms goodwill and cooperation continued at this point. The fall of Nicaea is viewed as a rare product of close cooperation between the Crusaders and the Byzantines. At the end of June, the Crusaders marched on through Anatolia. They were accompanied by some Byzantine troops under Tatikios, and still harbored the hope that Alexios would send a full Byzantine army after them. They also divided the army into two more easily managed groups, one contingent led by the Normans, the other by the French. The two groups intended to meet again at Doralium, but on July 1 the Normans, who had marched ahead of the French, were attacked by Kilij Arslan. Arslan had gathered a much larger army than he previously had after his defeat at Nicaea, and now surrounded the Normans with his fast-moving mounted archers. The Normans deployed in a tight-knit defensive formation. Surrounding all their equipment and the non-combatants who had followed them along the journey, and sent for help from the other group. When the French arrived, Godfrey broke through the Turkish lines and the legate Adhemer outflanked the Turks from the rear. The Turks, who had expected to destroy the Normans and did not anticipate the quick arrival of the French, fled rather than face the combined Crusader army. The Crusaders' march through Anatolia was thereafter unopposed, but the journey was unpleasant, as Arslan had burned and destroyed everything he left behind in his army's flight. It was the middle of summer, and the Crusaders had very little food and water, many men and horses died. Fellow Christians sometimes gave them gifts of food and money, but more often than not, 
the Crusaders simply looted and pillaged whenever the opportunity presented itself. Individual leaders continued to dispute the overall leadership, although none of them were powerful enough to take command on their own, as Adhemer was always recognized as the spiritual leader.